James Pippa, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for uh, coming to join us uh, this week. And um, we're nearly there. Where do you think there is? Where, where are we going to end up? <laughs> How many sleeps till election day, Uncle Gary? <laughs> Not one on election night. Mm. Pippa. Well, as things stand now, um, it looks like the most likely outcome is that Boris Johnson will get his uh, longed-for majority, but it's unclear what the scale of that might be. Could be a John Major-style one. It, well, we've heard polling from which would suggest that it could be anything up to 70 or 80, and at the other extreme that uh, he'd be lucky if he just gets single figures. Um, probably the reality is somewhere in between. Um, and it's certainly true that people in the Labour movement generally think that their best case scenario is a hung parliament. I haven't really heard anybody credibly suggest off the record that they have great hopes of a Labour majority. Of course, it is still a week out and we did have that pincer movement in the last, in the last week of the 27 campaign where Labour dramatically closed the gap. Still only obviously ended up in, um, uh, it still didn't end up with a majority. And it looks like the gap is closing much slower this time, although it is moving in that direction. So, you know, there could still be an upset, but as things stand, I think it looks like Boris Johnson has uh, probably uh, on course for a victory of some sort. The gambit has paid off, do you think, James? See, well, all else being equal at the moment, you would say that in 10 days' time, Boris Johnson is still Prime Minister. Um, I mean, it is the, uh, it calls to mind, uh, uh, Derry, was it Derry Irvin on Tony Blair, a man walking across a, uh, a polished marble floor carrying a Ming vase? Um, I think it was Roy Jenkins. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you know, As he approached the election. Yes. You get more and more careful, you know, smaller steps, more caution. Um, you know, absent, absent something unexpected, un, unexplained, entirely, yeah, the, black, the black swan, if you like, um, then you'd say that uh, that is the most, li yeah, the most likely outcome. Um, but, you know, uh, scale... He could still drop it. He could, yeah. I mean, only yeah, for you. But, but, but I mean, yeah, you would think, you, you would think that, you know, you know, yeah, if anybody can, you know, mess this up, and you know, it should be Boris Johnson, but actually he's been quite disciplined. Just before we get onto hmm. the Tories, Pippa, Labour have made the most extraordinary range of offers to the voters. I mean, they've promised Aladdin's cave of riches. Yeah. Has this landed, and if not, why? Well, I think that there's a genuine feeling out there in the country that they want, people want to see some of the uh, worst excesses of austerity curbed and some uh, you know, more investment in the public services and uh, some of the impact of the cuts, which have been pretty devastating in certain bits of the country, uh, addressed. So from that perspective, I think that people were generally quite welcoming of Libra's plans to invest more. I think the problem is that, and of course nobody, you know, everyone likes freebies, but the problem is that nobody um, really quite believes anything that any of the political parties are offering. And in Labour's case, it's because of the scale of the spending. Now, what Labour will say is that actually, if you look at what we're proposing, and a lot of it is capital investment and interest rates are low, we would only be spending, uh, we would be spending as much as sort of Northern European countries, some of the Scandinavian countries on public services, less than Germany spends on public services. So while it might seem radical to us here, because our state has been traditionally smaller, it's not by Northern European standards. However, I think there's so much much scepticism about some of the promises on offer and there was such a broad range of them in the Labour manifesto. Um, and Is that people, part of the problem you think? I think possibly. I think people All shall have prizes, money everywhere. Yeah, so and people inevitably question because we've sort of had this narrative over the last 10 years of us not having any money, suddenly where is all this money going to be found? People find that shift quite hard to make. So there's a lot of scepticism about that and more generally about what politicians of all parties are promising. But in terms of the scale of the spending, I think there's, I think that potentially that's a problem for Labour. Can I actually, one, I, I, I absolutely agree with all of that. One additional thought, something that surprised, slightly surprises me about the Labour manifesto is, if you are going to get into the business of you're promising to spend 80 billion pounds more, then another 60 billion pounds for, uh, yeah, for the WASP women's pensions and all the rest, then what they're proposing is not necessarily the best way to go about addressing a lot of the problems you just identified around austerity. 
Um, because actually, if I, if I was going to spend £80 billion trying to put right the problems of the last decade, I would start with uh, universal credit, with welfare, with a high work allowance. Yeah, uh, what, I certainly what, wouldn't be giving away a lot of money to middle class kids going to university. I probably wouldn't bother with, nationali with, with, with nationalising the trains and, ha and, and, and handing out cheaper, tra cheaper rail travel to, uh, to people who, current who can currently afford to use the train. Um, and I think that it's an interesting bit of electoral calculation behind this, that a lot of the freebies are actually driven by a desire to reach out to people a little bit uh, further up the income scale, in a way which, I mean, there's more political calculation than, than, than ideology there. And I think that's possibly what makes it a harder thing to believe from the electorate, because people, people can spot this. They can, people don't expect middle class yeah, perks. Yeah, you're giving, you're basically, you're, essentially, you're giving me, you're giving stuff to people who you, 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 who you want to vote for you. Whereas actually, I think the, the, the logic of the Jeremy Corbyn brand would have been to say, well, actually, I'm Jeremy Corbyn. I have spent 30 years in, in politics campaigning for the people who are worst off. And so, yes, I am going to transform the state. I'm going to bring about that uplift. But compensating for the bedroom tax rather and than so wasps. Yeah, and so I'm going to pour all. I'm going to pour lots of this money into sure start into uh, into welfare. Uh, that is my focus. I will make this a, f a truly fair country, and I'm not sure that as you know, I mean, tuition fees is the, is, is the best example. But free broadband, we want you. Why give free broadband for everybody? People brought why, that why, up in a focus group. Yeah, we why, did. Why, why give? Why? Why? They were slightly like baffled. Yeah. I mean, if you're concerned about the digital, exclu digital, the, the digital exclusion of the poor, well, I mean, you could achieve a lot more for people who are digitally excluded uh, in a more effective way. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm just I'm, this is almost observation, really. I'm, I'm surprised that a party that, he, that says it is entirely focused on uh, improving the, the outcomes of the people at the absolute bottom of the income scale hasn't focused more of its policy offer on, on those people. And I wonder whether or not that has, what has, what has slightly undermined the the credibility of the offer to, uh, among the electorate. There's, there's a theory about the breadth of the Labour manifesto, which is that it's not just designed at the public out there, it's designed, it's focused at the Labour movement itself. And however, however the party ends up moving forward after this election, presumably at some point there'll be a new leader, it's a way of whoever takes over being able to preserve what Corbynism has done up until this point by saying, look, X million people voted for this manifesto, so a new leader can't just come and rip it all up and start again and a way of in some way sort of guaranteeing some sort of continuity by keeping it as, as wide and as radical and ambitious as possible. Entrenching Corbyn's radicalism after Corbyn. And do you think that'll work? We might as well have a look at post-election um, era. Uh, everybody's sitting around thinking about it as well as thinking about mm. the election. Where do you think the Labour Party goes if the scenario you talked about being possible, uh, Boris Johnson getting majority comes to pass? I think it depends how big that majority is, and there will certainly be a lot of pressure from the existing leadership to stay on if that majority is fairly small, because potentially the government would be fairly unstable. As we know from watching Parliament over you know, decades, um, uh, majorities whittle down steadily over the courses of Parliament, and they would want to be in a position to capitalise on that, particularly with all the uncertainty of the next stage of Brexit and its passage through Parliament as well. However, there'll be a lot of pressure for that not to happen from us elsewhere in the Labour movement and the feeling that while it's all very well saying after the 2017 election when Labour um, outperformed expectations that that, was a, that that was a reason for Jeremy Corbyn to stay on and continue because the trajectory of the Labour movement was right, was correct. I think when it happens twice, when you're starting from a position of you know, ostensibly greater strength um, and you don't put on as much as many votes as you as you might as you should to win a majority then that you know he's had his second chance and he has to go um, and I think you know Corbyn the man I mean everyone's people are divided about this but to me he you do wonder whether actually at this point he'll have pressure from his family um, whether he himself will feel he's done his bit he's transformed the Labour Party um, you know, poten potentially permanently in terms of the membership. He's taken it in a much more leftwards direction, which I think will live on beyond Corbyn, irrespective of who takes after over afterwards. Very difficult to reverse some of that. And um, 
and um, he will feel that he's done his he'll done his time. He's done his time, and it's time so for somebody may, else. So he may just hang around for a little while to sort out the succession, but not for well, long. Well, does he do that, or does somebody else? I mean, if he Caretaker. decides if he decides at eight a.m. or nine a.m. on the Friday or next Friday morning that he's had enough and that's it, they hand over to a caretaker. A caretaker. That's up to the NEC to decide who that person is. And you know, the obvious candidate is John McDonnell. Does John McDonnell become the figure that that oversees the process for the next leader? The king or queen maker? Possibly, yeah. James, does that sound where Labour is right. heading to you? I mean, Entrenched I, more or less where it is now in the in the political debate. But I, I have I have no insight into the, 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 upper, the upper echelons of the what 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 goes on in the Labour Party at the moment. But looking at the, the Labour Party from a, an organisational perspective, I think Peter's point about the, the Corbyn transformation of the party via the membership is crucial, uh, and this is something I, I think you know, still isn't often recognised well enough around around Westminster that you know, Jeremy Corbyn built a new party. Um, he brought in what three, four hundred thousand new members um, uh, who are there, who are there to back his project, and so uh, you were never you know, you know obviously lots of people are having this conversation at the moment about the future, the future leadership and direction of the Labour Party, and uh, you know, nobody said Keir Starmer or, or Emily Thornberry's names yet, but I as a you know, distant observer of these things these days, I find it very hard to think that the Labour Party membership that joined to back the Jeremy Corbyn project. Um, will respond even to, uh, would respond, since it's hypothetical, to election defeat by deciding that what they needed was a, uh, uh, essentially a more centrist... A lurch to the uh, right, as they might say. Yeah, mm. a, a more centrist figure. So I, I, I assume that Corbynism is embedded because the party is a, you know, the party is a party made in Corbyn's image. And, they, uh, and so, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, the names, you know, the only names we, we will seem, you know, one hears as being plausible are Laura Pidcock and Rebecca Long-Bailey, but... And maybe Angela Rayner. The two names you mentioned originally, Emily Thornberry and Keir Starmer, um, aren't, aren't just uh, traditionally or in their past from a different bit mm. of the party, uh, but they're also from London. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, and I just think, well, uh, where, don't you think people, some of the voters that have been lost in this election potentially to Labour, and yeah. of course, all the cabinets, well, yeah, uh, the, the party will be looking for someone who can make a better connection with those voters. There's several considerations, but I think over and above any of them is loyalty. And what both Keir and Emily have been is loyal to, the, to Corbyn himself and to the Corbyn project. And that will not pass members by. There are, of course, other factors. You mentioned the, the sort of the north-south divide and the fact that the Labour Party has is sort of a, it's become a, a not very comfortable marriage between sort of the traditional heartlands, working class part of the Labour Party and the middle classes increasingly, you know, remain backing middle classes in urban centres, more affluent, younger. And, and th that's the problem that any leader of the Labour Party is going to have to face, how to sort of, how to keep those two bits of the party together. So there's the north-south thing. There's obviously the the leave remain aspect which spans much of that same territory um, in terms of geography but also in age um, and and then the third aspect which is crucial i think is whether the labor party ends up with a woman leader now john mcdonnell and others have said that the next leader of the labor party has to be a woman there's sort of almost like a this sort of feeling that um amongst mps um that you know, there's a moral compulsion to make sure that the party which has led for decades on gender equality has never had a woman leader and now is the moment. And there's even sort of rumours going around about whether there's some way you could have, not necessarily an all women shortlist, but whether you could guarantee that a woman was, was uh, or a proportion of women were on the final slate. So um, those are the considerations that any candidate, anyone who's considering putting themselves forward will have to make. And of course, the party ultimately, being one member, one vote, will have to decide. But those are the things they'll be looking at, definitely. We said we'd come back to the Tories. If it is a majority, uh, and if it's a majority that gives Boris John Johnson a certain amount of comfort, let's say a bit above the John Major size oh, majority, yeah. Yeah. but uh, 30 something, yeah. 40 something, 50 something, if it were to be in that realm, what kind of government would it be, James? Well, I think, well, in, in that scenario, in that, you know, if, if in two weeks' time we're looking, we're looking at a, a re-elected Tory government with, with that solid majority, I think we will look back at the general election campaign and conclude that the most important moment of the campaign was the decision Boris Johnson took to, uh, to junk the corporation tax cuts that were scheduled and spend or allocate the money from those cuts to public services instead. Because that, uh, you know, that is a 
quite an important sign about how the Tory electoral strategy at this election is feeding through into policy. Because if he gets that majority, if he's there with a majority of 30, it's because he's won, yeah, and this is a question for low party, he, he's won Bolsover, he's won, he's won Gedling, he's won, obviously, you, you know, he's won Workington, he, he's won seats where the Tories have not previously won before, the seats that, that Theresa May went after in 2017. And he will depend for his working majority on those seats, the voters in those seats, and the MPs returned by those constituents. And how easy will it be for him to keep to that no. message and not give tax, I mean, give ta tax yeah. cuts away? We had Sanjay Javid, we're speaking yeah. on Thursday, yeah. uh, he was speaking on the radio this morning, uh, emphasising the fairly puny national insurance yeah. Uh, yeah. cut, uh, as if it was going to be a tax cutting government. Yeah. But you look at the no, manifesto, it's a tax raising yeah, government that comes yeah. in. To be honest, this morning, yeah, this morning, yeah, this morning's headlines about yeah, Tories promised tax cutting budget. That, that, that's, present, that's presentation for, for the benefit of my former colleagues in, in the right wing press. You and seem to put it on their front page. Yeah, of course, yeah, because they like it, because everyone likes to, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a comfortable story. But they're dancing an old tune. Yeah, yeah the, reality, the reality will be that the small state libertarian wing of the Tory party, which has never been that big anyway, that desperately wants to shrink, to shrink the state slash tax uh, yeah, you, 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 they, you, they've lost. It's quite big um, around that cabinet table, isn't it? Yeah, but they, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming talking, it's the I'm, same cabinet or something talking, like I, it. I was talking to somebody about the, about the other the, the week who said that, that you, they've lost and they know they've lost and they'll fold. Uh, and yes, they will, you know, they will talk a good fight, but you know, if Boris Johnson wins this, wins this election, if he does, I mean, literally, if he wins, you know, if he increases the Tory majority at the year, uh, fourth year, at, at a fourth year, fourth consecutive year election as, as, as the year, uh, then he does what he wants. Forget your tax and cuts. And the, 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 the idea that you know, a cabinet, you know, a Tory coalition of libertarians will, 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 will say, actually, no, we have to return, revert to true, you know, you know, true blue values. If, 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 if he, he, he sticks on the strategy, follows through, then that, that, will, that, will, that will carry and no amount of libertarian dreaming elsewhere in the Tory party will, you know, will swing that Tory party around. Because how, how do you, you know, how, how, you know, if you win an election with the votes of Northern Leavers, um, you know, and you then give them you give them Singapore on you know, Singapore in you know, on sea, they're probably not going to thank you. Just as we were talking about scepticism earlier that surrounds Labour's policies, um, spending pledges. There's also a great deal of scepticism about whether the Conservatives would actually do anything for the public services. And I've, you know, I've been out on the doorstep quite a lot, on the campaign trail quite a lot. And um, what is very clear that there's is very low level of trust across the board and that amongst those Labour voters in, in those leave seats and the sort of places that James has mentioned, there's a feeling that amongst those that are prepared to support the, the Conservatives that it's very much about lending their vote to the Tories this time and that's primarily because of Brexit and their belief that Boris Johnson will deliver or get Brexit done, whatever that means. Um, and he's kind of neutralised their concerns to a certain extent about public services by talking, the talk at least, about reinvesting in some key areas like 20,000 police and so on. But as we all know, that doesn't even go as far as taking the country back to it was to where it was in 2010. So it's just a few very targeted, a few very targeted interventions, which convince will convince people enough to vote for him this time. But I think it's going to be really interesting when you're talking about the Tory party going forward. Is what is the Tory party then? Does it become the party of the Northern working class Leave voter, or does it sort of pivot back to its its sort of middle class roots in the shires and and you know representing big business and so on because currently it's it's doing what the Labour Party's had to do for decades and face in both directions at once and when if Boris Johnson ends up with a comfortable majority in running a government for the next five years how does it look then does he is he reshaping the Conservative Party for good or is he going to end up with his own rather uncomfortable marriage between two very different groups of people that want two quite different things and you touched on Singapore on the Thames and what this all means for the Brexit settlement, uh, assuming again a, a Boris Johnson majority government, um, for the purposes of this argument, what, what, what does that kind of uh, voter base tell us Boris Johnson's settlement with Europe will look like? 
Will he run scared every time it looks like a, a certain sector of the economy is squealing and saying, well, actually, we want to stay close? And will it all be a lot closer than you'd think from uh, to the EU institutions than you'd well, think from his rhetoric? Well, the first question is the timetable as to what you know, what what you know, we heard Sergio Javan this morning saying we'll have a, the whole the full future relationship sorted, signed, sealed, delivered by you know, by middle of next year, which obviously we won't. Um, so first, the first thing he's got to do is he's got to break his cardinal his his latest cardinal promise not to extend the transition. And if he's got a majority, um, you think he can probably get away with yeah, that and call no. it something else. Yeah. He'll blame it on someone else as well. Yeah. He'll, find, yeah. he'll find someone to blame. Or, 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 yeah, or there, is a, there may be a way to agree a, sort of a, thin, yeah, a, a, thin, a thin agreement on certain areas and leave lots of other chapters open. And I think there is a question, there is a really interesting question. But some comes, sleight of hand. Yeah, it comes back to Pippa's point about, about you know, Brexit, you know, Brexit, if he wins, Brexit gets him, you know, Brexit gets him over the line till about till, till January. It does not seal the deal for the next general election. That's when the second half of the slogan comes in. Get Brexit done and then invest in the rest. I mean, that's, you know, so Brexit may win the 2019 general election for the Tories, but obviously you've then, you know, the second half of the slogan comes in. Unleash Britain's Matt, Matt, Matt. potential. He's not getting a chance to get anywhere near Matt. that. Yeah. Um, so what, what, so what sort of deal does it look like? Um, I well, um, I think the was it last week, last last Friday, the announcement about ending yeah, ending state aid rules is very interesting in this context. Very um, partly in a funny way, because actually ending state aid rules, if you're serious about that, makes it really it makes it much harder to do a deal because state aid rules are a minimum for the level playing field the EU will insist. I and mean, they may they may well say, look, we're not going to talk to you until you until you yeah, that's our that's our baseline, but. Um, yeah, if you don't do a deal, a substantive deal, then yeah, that allows significant, yeah, yeah, significant uh, access, yeah, access and goods to, yeah, uh, to the EU, then there's quite a lot of pain ahead for UK manufacturing and large, uh, large employers. And you need to be free of the state aid rules, frankly, to bail out those employers. Um, so certainly a more, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating this as policy, but I think it, you would find a Tory party in office having to do quite a lot of interventionist things to protect British jobs from the consequences of, of, of their primary policy of leaving the European Union. But that's, you know, you know uh, as with all things, it's a, it's a problem. You, you, you burn that bridge when you come to it, as I say. Um, what did you make of that? Uh, well, I think, the, I think the, the, reality, the reality is, is that, you know, you speak to Sajid Javid and others and they'll say, um, we can do this very quickly because we're so closely aligned. But our starting point is that we're in very similar positions. This is talking about the EU trade deal, obviously. And um, but they, but Boris Johnson has consistently said that he wants Britain to be able to set its own standards and regulations and so on. So the further away you move from the level playing field at the start, the harder it's going to be to negotiate. And you're going to have to negotiate sector by sector by sector, and that is inevitably going to take time. So it also above it all is sort of this decision that ultimately looks to, to me needs to be made about whether you're going, whether Boris Johnson is going to, in terms of Britain's future relationship with the rest of the world, stay facing the European Union as the, as the UK has um, and have a close relationship with our biggest trading bloc or pivot across the Atlantic and have a trading relationship, a free trade agreement with the United States. And I think to try and do both on equal terms is going to be very difficult, precisely because of those issues around standards and regulations. And um, and either way he does it, it's going to be it's going to be really complicated. And it's just I just can't see it being done um, in you know they have to make a decision to extend or not by July. So do, I you just think, can't do you think there'll ever be a US UK free trade agreement of the kind that was? Advertised very a comprehensive one. Politi very, very difficult politically to Give, deliver. Given you look at when Bassett or Man won't like some of the ideas that uh, uh, Donald Trump says are opening requests, are opening requirements yeah. of any negotiation. Yeah. I, don't I think know. it's very, very hard to do. When you look at the main points of contention, the starting point that the US trade negotiators are going to be coming, whether it's the NHS, which obviously has become a big political football in this election campaign, or whether you're looking at food standards, or whether, you're, you know, and then the future of services in the UK. I mean, it just is it's very good to be very complicated politically to sell uh, having that sort of FTA with the US. You, you've described how the Labour Party is going to be potentially quite turbulent, change and all that sort of thing, the other side of an election, if it's the result we were just talking about. But if a lot of these ideas that we think what might emerge in a Boris Johnson government, do we really think he's rolled the pitch for them within the Conservative ranks? I, I, I know there's a great kudos that a new leader with a, a relatively new leader with a, who's won a majority 
gets. But, but he, doesn't, he hasn't said much, though, has he? He's, say, he's, he's built on Theresa May's NHS funding plan, which you know, was, was not particularly controversial even when she didn't have a majority in the Conservative Party. Everybody seems agreed that you can invest billions more in the NHS and you need to. He's talked about 20,000 police officers. That's pretty much, you know, there's very little detail in terms of funding beyond that. But if he wants to take things policy. where James says he wants to take them, both on Europe, uh, and as, as you were saying as well, uh, but also on policy, you don't get the tax cuts that you normally get out of a Tory government and all the rest of it. Will it be turbulent on the Tory side? Or do you predict actually majorities, if, you, if you've won a majority, that, that... I don't think you do very much. I mean, he's talked about fixing social care, for example. Mm. We would, you know, the big promise on the streets, mm. of, on the steps of Downing Street about um, fixing the social care crisis, and there's very little there's detail. Nothing. So you can see, you know, something like that, you could see just being pushed further and further down. We want a cross-party agreement. Well, let's let's all have some lovely talks about it and maybe come up with a commission, and then suddenly you're on the verge of the next general election, and they park it again. So lots of triangulating rhetoric is how you would see perhaps a future Boris Johnson government without and much how achievement. Much action. Mm. Uh, well, I think I think there is. If you look at the the manifesto, which I know is derided as being terribly cautious and you know, you know, boring, which in many ways it is, and some of the pledges on the on the campaign trail, particularly around things like industrial, what used to be called industrial uh, industrial strategy, uh, investment you know, investment in R and D, investment in, in infrastructure. I mean, he can, he could say actually he's been relatively clear that he wants to spend quite a lot of money doing quite a lot of stuff to to to, to extend to have a have a bigger more active. Uh, more active state, and will the question is, will we obviously will the Conservative Party put up with that? I two two points, and I, you know, to, to consider one uh, that majority that we talked about, if it happens, will depend on the newly elected Conservative MPs for Workington, Bolsover, and Ashfield, and places like that. Now they in turn MPs tend to tend to want to keep their seats. Um, now those MPs probably won't think that they keep their seats by uh, voting through tax cuts for people on high on high, on on high wages and uh, a reduction in health spending, for instance. So they will, you know, so that will, that, yeah, they will be an interesting force. The other point I would look at in terms of Conservative Party discipline is uh, Boris Johnson, for whatever reason, has a significant ability to. Uh, get away with things in terms of the Tory party. Um, you know, his colleagues will give him a lot of license. Uh, you look at the way the ERG, the terrifying titans of the ERG who promised blood and thunder if, if promises were broken and if he took one more step towards extension or uh, if he failed to meet his deadline then there would be awful, awful things would happen. Well. He seems to be quite secure in the party at the moment. And that's before we get to this point in the scenario where he's just done the impossible and delivered a working Tory majority uh, in a fourth general election. So I, I just, I, I think we have to factor in you know, a quite significant change in the dynamics and sort of uh, the power balance in the Conservative Party in, in the scenario that we're talking about. If it's a hung parliament, mm. Pippa? Oh, well, that's a whole can of worms, isn't it? Well, I mean, who's the biggest party? We all talk, everyone talks about hung parliament in, in terms of, you know, the Labour Party being able to f form a minority or trying to form a minority administration, uh, potentially with the support unofficially on a vote-by-vote -vote basis with the SNP and even the Lib Dems. But is Boris Johnson going to go anywhere? I mean, is he going to stand up and say, hi, guy, OK, guys, you have your go now? Or will he try to lead a minority administration himself? I mean, you're into sort of you know, cancel Christmas territory um, in terms of the negotiations. Labour clearly will want to go into it with Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister and as the large, if they're the largest party, as a minority administration and have challenged already the other parties that agree with them on quite a lot of things in terms of public services investment, second referendum for Brexit, some of the reform programme, to join them on a vote by vote basis and and effectively, if they bring down a minority administration to allow in the Tories, which is how they'll, you know, they, they, how they how they would spin it. Um, but before we even get to that stage of being able to have votes, we're you know we're into really complicated scenarios to who can agree what and whether and and whether you know they, anybody can actually say that they genuinely command the confidence of the House to be able to form that government in the first place. I just assume if it's a, if it's hung parliament, we have another general election before yeah, by the spring mm. next year, don't we? Or, I mean, or autumn, maybe. Yeah, but I mean, why? Is that after the referendum? No, but ah, but you see, this is uh, I, uh, lots of people I've talked to say, well, if we're hung up, then 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 we have a referendum. Um, we have a second referendum. Well, a on what? Um, I mean, on you know, so what are the terms? But also remember, a referendum has to be passed through Parliament. 
and if you know, same situation, you know, same truth. There's be same same thing. The same thing will then be true as has been true for the last several years. If you know, if we have a hung parliament, then there is probably not a majority in that parliament for a referendum. Um, uh, and so the only way you resolve that is to get a new parliament. Um, so the reason you, uh, I think, if you know, the fun never ends. Um, <laughs> I mean, if it's, honestly, if it's a hung part, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go back to Thumbland. Uh, I'm going to yeah, stay my brother's farm, and I'm not going to turn the phone off, and I'm giving up, and I, I'll, I don't know, I'll help, I'll help out with the sheep or something. I'm not. I'm done. I'm finished. Um, Westminster's over. Um, listeners may have heard a, a, a banging in the background, um, which could be. Joe Swinson trying to uh, come out of a cupboard, or, or, or it may be the construction of a kitchen here in Millbank. Um, what, what about Joe Swinson and the Lib Dems? Uh, I, actually, I've just come from a Brexit Party uh, event, or people who have just resigned the whip of the Brexit Party. Um, and it looks like uh, there could be, well, th that party is presumably a goner at uh, the moment, if it were to be a Boris Johnson government and Brexit has happened and all the rest of it. Uh, but the Lib Dems, what happens the other side? Well, I think, I mean, it depends on, well, lots of things. I mean, I think they, both Brexit Party and the Lib Dems started off this election race thinking, I think as lots of people felt, that, that the political boundaries had been redrawn and the, the domination of British politics by two parties that we've seen, you know, for the best part of a century, was going to fall away and was going to change. And what has become strikingly clear as the race has gone on is that it's still the same old two-party race. And it shrinks some, mid-term and whereas, then expands again at general elections, people, it seems. Well, exactly. And whereas some people are motivated by voting what their, their party is, prom, you know, voting for a party in terms of their, their promises. Um, lots of people are also voted, motivated in terms of voting against another party. So therefore, you'll see, you know, you'll see Brexit Party um, supporters backing the Conservatives so that they can vote for... Um, so they could vote for Brexit and you might see Lib Dems coming to back um, Labour so they could vote against austerity or, or against Boris Johnson. So it looks to me like this is a two, a two horse race and that the Lib Dems will be even more squeezed than the polls suggest they're going to be at the moment. And of course, that then brings Joe Swinston's future into doubt. If indeed she manages to hang on to her seat, because the Scottish National Party are piling in massive resources to her seat. She lost it previously, of course. And so she might not even survive this election. And then you're into a whole, you know, another leadership contest there. And the Lib Dems having to think seriously about their, the position they've taken thus far on Brexit and whether that was the right one for them. We were told this was going to be an extraordinary new centre force moment, Brexit, and you know, all sorts of Blairites would end up there and there. And you're left with just one party, potentially very beleaguered in the House of Commons. Is that, is that really where it'll settle, do you think? Well, I think... Um, well, it, the, the judgment will be that the the decision to go all out as the revoke party um, was pro was a mistake. Um, it was it was a mistake based on the assumption that the Labour Party was about to shift heavily towards the Remain position and did not do so. Um, so I think that yeah that was a yeah that will be recorded as a mistake. I mean I think there's a, yeah uh, a, yeah only maybe the Lib Dems are sort of the the canary down the mine for this question about how long. Brexit identities persist in British politics because they, they took a gamble that Brexit was going to be the defining cleavage of, of, of voter behaviour. That you know, the half the population was very, were, were, is Remain, and therefore, if you are the most Remain party, you will get their votes. Turns out it's not actually how voters behave. They're a bit more you know, calculating than that. They're um, a bit more tactical. Uh, yes, I mean, in the, in the, so, which is why you've seen Remain is, you know, despite the fact that the Labour position is, is, is carefully ambiguous on, 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 on Leave Remain, that's why you've seen Remain voters still voting. People who are motivated by Remain are voting Labour because they kind of, that is the best Remain option, the most Remain-y thing you can do, even though it's not pure Remain. So, um, yeah, but the question will be, again, scenario, hypothetical, uh, Boris Johnson gets a majority, delivers Brexit in the sense of ends legal membership on the 31st of January. Um, what's the salience of Brexit for the next few years? Um, becomes it, a two-generation project, does it, a, yeah. a more distant goal. But also, you know, basically, because you know, you know, yes, trade talks will be exciting, but will, will Brexit start to, start to drift down the agenda a bit? In which case, the Lib Dems, actually like all parties, will have, will, will have to start thinking what their offer is. Um, and certainly, once we once we leave, what does the revoke party do? Do they become the rejoin party? 
um, which might, might be the sensible thing to do. Um, but uh, yeah, you're not, you're not going to bring about the you bring about the rejoining of uh, you know, you're not going to take Britain back into the European Union in, in the space of a couple of years. It is yeah, it will be a generational effort. Um, but there is a long in the scenario that we are discussing. There is a long, hard road and some very a lot of serious thinking to be done for the Lib Dems. Whether or not they can do it, because they because back to, back to the membership question. I mean, we haven't we never really talk about this. Uh, amazingly, Westminster is not consumed with excitement talking about Lib Dem membership. But there's been a big shift in the Lib Dem membership, like a blood transfusion. Yeah. Lots, you know, much as Corbyn, you know, Corbyn changed, changed, changed the, the, the structure of the nature of the Labour Party for the membership. Brexit changed the, it changed, it changed the Lib Dems. They got well, 80, you know, 70, 80, 100,000 new members, most of whom joined on direct debit because they thought because they, they were unhappy about Brexit. And they don't turn up to meetings, they don't wear the sandals, they don't come to glee clubs, they don't sing the songs. <laughs> Uh, it's a different. You know, they that is a different party too. And what it does after 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 Brexit, and those things after Brexit, after we leave the European Union, if that happens, I don't know. The the, the banging has stopped from the next door room. <laughs> I think Jo Swinson's decided to stay in. in the cupboard after the, <laughs> after your depressing scenarios for her. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, James, very much indeed for sharing your thoughts today.